Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Association for Court Management's webinar entitled Four Key Ways to Prepare Your Court for Online Dispute Resolution. On behalf of NACOM's Board of Directors and the Association, I thank Tyler Technologies for sponsoring and presenting this program. My name is Alice Roberts, and I am serving as the moderator today. I am the Special Projects Coordinator for the Alaska Court System, and I serve on NACOM's Board of Directors. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. This presentation will be approximately one hour. We are recording today's webinar and the recording along with the PowerPoint slide that the presenter is using today will be available for members on NACOM's website. You can submit questions to today's presenter throughout the presentation by typing your questions into the questions pane of the attendee control panel as shown on the current slide. The presenter will address your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Our speaker today is Jamie Gillespie. Jamie is the general manager for Tyler Technologies ODR Modria platform. Excuse me, ODR platform Modria. She has been working in the court software industry for nearly 20 years and is a certified mediator. She received a BBA in Computer Information Systems from Texas State University. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks, Alice, for the introduction, and hello to everyone on the call. Um, just to kind of get started, I am uh, from Texas, and I do try to warn people that you might hear a bit of twang in my voice, although I, I never hear it. Uh, a lot of people seem to tell me I have an accent. So, um, hopefully it won't be too disturbing to you as I go through uh, the presentation today. So to get started, I really wanted to kind of do a little bit of level setting and really try to kind of start out with what the definition of online dispute resolution is. So the National Center for State Courts recently updated the definition for ODR, and they came up with um, the definition that I have on the screen. So it's a court-related online dispute resolution is a public-facing digital space in which the parties can convene to respond to their disputes or case. But they have three key components that are really important to this and really kind of set apart what court ODR is versus ODR in other spaces such as like e-commerce and such. So the three essential components are uh, the first one is that it must be exclusively online. So in contrast to other court programs that provide like an online interface, um, but then there's also discrete tasks that are done outside of an online mechanism, this way is really set to be all online. <clears throat> the next one is the, that it's explicitly designed to assist the litigants in resolving their disputes or case. So, you know, rather than a technology platform that is helpful for the judicial side or the court staff in decision making, this is really for the litigants. So there are some challenges that come with, um, you know, just the validity of claims or the defense that happens, but ODR is really uh, focused on negotiating payment schedules, satisfying disputes, and so forth. So it must be there to help the litigants resolve their disputes. And then the last item is that it's hosted or supported by the judicial branch. So it's not a form of, of a private ADR firm. So it's not something that, um, you know, in a particular area that may have a nonprofit um, ADR firm is using to kind of get all of these court cases. It's really something that the court is sponsoring and pushing the cases through. And that doesn't mean that some of those um, nonprofits and such are the ones that are doing the mediation if it gets to that point. But the main focus and the main part of that is really at the, the court level or the, the jurisdiction the state level. So those are the three uh, main components for it. And that really kind of just sets the stage for what we're going to talk about today as we get into all the things that you're going to want to consider as you go through the process of, of implementing ODR. Okay, so the next 
uh, thing is just kind of I wanted to talk through the agenda and just tell you what all we're going to talk about and which phases they're in. So we're going to start out and really talk about the case type and some of the components within the case types and what's important on each of those. Then we're going to talk about stakeholder support and we're going to get into kind of some recommendations for you on people that you need to get involved in the process and how to best get them to engage. Uh, then we'll do some awareness and just how to get the, the message out about the program. And then the last, um, the last step is for us to define success. So really to determine how we're going to measure success and, and what those elements are going to be so that we're prepared before we even start to know what is considered good here. All right, so we're going to start with the first one and start with the case type planning. So as you can see, there's quite a few case types that ODR is known to be able to accommodate. But really, this isn't an all-inclusive list. I mean, there could be case types that you're handling maybe based on a local rule that aren't on the list or others that, that are part of just our you know, regular court processes that aren't there. But as long as the case has a dispute where parties need to negotiate, then it's it's a primary candidate for an ODR process. And it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a plaintiff and defendant type case or a case with multiple parties like that. It can be, you know, a defendant and maybe a prosecutor negotiating if it's something maybe like a plea agreement and such. So really what you want to do at this point is you want to think about um, where you would have the most support from your judicial staff, your attorneys, and any other stakeholders um, that you have when you're trying to pick where you're going to start. You know, you also want to, to look back at some of the cases that you have, maybe which ones have the largest backlog, or maybe it's even the largest volume that comes through there that kind of does bog down the court a little bit. Maybe it's not necessarily has a large backlog because you're able to get through them, but maybe those cases uh, create a backlog for other cases. Um, you know, maybe you have divorce cases where, uh, or modification orders, and that's just a ton of those that are coming through. So you really just kind of want to sit through and look through all of your cases and kind of evaluate each one of the cases and try to figure out, hey, what, what is the overall process of this and how does it impact the court system? And you really, you know, your best bet is to pick a case type that you feel like you're going to have success with because obviously, as we get through this, once you're able to prove success on, you know, one, then it's a lot easier to get buy-in and support on those additional case types. But the key thing to remember is you don't have to do them all at once. You can do these in, in an order that makes sense for your jurisdiction with your staffing and, and the processes that you have. And you can always add additional case types. This is one of many. So I always encourage people, hey, if you don't have a lot of people that are going to be able to help in this, and you're going to pick every, every type, because you might not be successful that way. Instead, pick a case type and really focus on that. So there's just some things to think about when you're looking at what case load that you want to start with. So the next thing to think about is just your integrations and how that may work. So first, I'm going to just kind of talk through your current processes, process, and this really should mimic most jurisdictions' ecosystem. Um, so right here, we're starting with e-filing. It would go into some kind of queue process for people to review. Once that happens, then it would go to the case management system, and then after that, once it gets to the clerk and it's starting to be worked, um, that is when we could get to the point of being able to put it uh, to an ODR system. So the clerk would do some, some work. It would go into the ODR system, and then the, the data could be passed back to the case management system and also back to the e-filing system. So at a very high level, that's kind of your normal court process. But that's not the only way to do it you can do what we call a manual mode. So what happens in the manual approach is it just puts a little more burden on the court staff to manually create these disputes or these tasks in the ODR system. 
and then to manually upload any outcome back into the case management system that may come from uh, the ODR process. But you know, if you're in the middle of switching case management systems or maybe implementing a new case management system or you're, you know that you're going to in the near future, it might not make sense to spend the time to do that integration when there is a way to do it without it. Or maybe you want to get started with your ODR process and you want to do that sooner than what an, an integration could happen. So maybe you want to start with that and then allow um, an integration to come afterwards. So really, this manual model is its definitely an option. It's just going to put a little bit more burden on the staff up front. But again, just because you start there doesn't mean that's where you have to stay. And then the second option is that integrated model. And it's really similar to uh, what I showed at the top. We just kind of took out the components that didn't uh, necessarily walk through the initial filing of the case and so forth. And this is where we say, okay, once the case gets to the ODR system, um, you can have integration back and forth between your case management system. So from the ODR system, you could send data to your case management, letting them know kind of the status of what's happening. Um, on the case, and then the case management system could send updates as well to the ODR system. So again, it's just this bilateral communication that can happen between those two systems. And then the other side is, again, on that e-filing. If you're a jurisdiction that has mandatory e-filing, you might want to pass that document back through the e-filing system once it's been uh, either resolved or maybe it's um, something that shows we didn't come to an agreement, but we still want to pass back whatever the outcome of that particular item was. So again, obviously with your integration, you're, there might be some upfront work that has to be done to get it to where it needs to be, but then in the long term, just like you would expect, that will take less responsibility of the clerks and the court staff to be able to continue to manage that if you're doing it electronically. But really, there's nothing that's stopping you from being able to be successful in that manual approach. So as you think about these, there's you know, different components you may want to think about whenever you're deciding, am I going to be an integrated um, ODR process or, if I'm an, or am I going to be a non-integrated? So really kind of think through what, your, you know, what approach you have and how that fits best into your current system. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the notification options and some things to consider about that. So in this particular example, I'm specifically showing a case that's more like maybe a small claims or a parenting or some case that has a typical plaintiff defendant model. Um, but the first thing that you need to do is you need to think about how are you going to get that contact information, email address or cell phone numbers or whatever it's going to be. And then you need to think about which contact method are you going to use. To do something like texting, that may require that you send an opt-in approach to the parties to allow them to opt in to getting messages. And you may also need to consider something like a quiet time, because if, if you have someone responding to the case at 3 a.m., you may not want to send a notification to the other party at 3 a.m. So think about what is the best time to send notifications, what are any rules that you have to follow around that type of notification, and you know, get all of that kind of worked out. Once you figure out what method you want to use to communicate to the parties and what rules apply, then you need to determine what types of parties should be included in that notification or invitation. So in this example, the visual representation has um, me sending it to both, um, or I'm sorry, it's just showing that both plaintiffs and the defendant have attorneys. But obviously, you know, some cases, um, maybe one party is represented or maybe even neither are represented. So, you know, we even have some jurisdictions that regardless of the party representation, we always have to send the information to the parties themselves. 
You know, I know, for example, in California, that like in a small claims case, they can't have attorney representation in court. So maybe that's something to think about. So as we go in through this, the next example is showing us that we are going to notify the plaintiff and defendant. So again, just something to think about if that's the approach that you want to take. Do you want to have it where it sends to the parties? Well, when there's an attorney involved, would you prefer that it goes to the attorney and not to the party and put the burden onto the attorney to let the party know that this process is engaged? Or does the attorney get to negotiate maybe on behalf of the party? <clears throat> and then there's even another approach that said, hey, maybe we're going to let everyone know about it. We're going to send it to all the parties involved and their representation if they have any. So then everyone's getting notified. Or even one more thing to think about is maybe it's sent to the attorneys and then the parties are in some kind of like a view only type approach where they can see what's happening, but they're not the ones that are actually doing the negotiation. So, you know, I really talked about, I think there were four different approaches there, but you need to think about, depending on the type of case it is, and maybe your rules that you have now when something is filed into the case, what is your process for notification? Do you notify the attorneys only? Do you notify all parties? Do you notify only the case parties and not their represent, you know, their, their attorney representation? So really this is gonna be different based on your jurisdiction and potentially based on the type of case. Again, I cited uh, that California doesn't allow the attorneys like in the courtroom for a small claims case. So maybe you have certain cases that the overall ADR process you remove attorneys for them, or maybe you want them to participate, the attorneys to participate instead of the parties. So just kind of think through on a case type by case type basis, because you can change that depending on which type of case that you're working on. So the next thing that we want to do is talk about our timelines. So first, I'm going to walk you through how we picture a typical um, ODR process happening on a case. Now, before I get started on this, there is an approach that could make it where you do ODR before a case is ever filed into the court. And that process is 100% available and it is an option for you to consider. As I've traveled around the, not just the US, but even the world, I have a lot of people that get very scared about that process because we're somewhat excluding the court. Um, from a pre-filing process, and so they're a little bit hesitant on it. So most of our customers, or actually all of the customers that we have right now, are doing this approach where they're putting it into a case that's already filed. But again, as you're thinking bigger and bigger about justice reform, doing it before a case is ever filed may be something that you want to think about and maybe approach down the line. So first, um, the case to then. then we are going to get an answer on that case or a response. And then from there, we're going to set the hearing. So you can see that um, from the time I have the hearing set, I then have this kind of big space there that says hearing held. And then after that, we would have a proposed order from the outcome of the hearing and then the final order to close the case. So right there is kind of what we consider a very simplified, obviously, uh, process. So what you can see right here is that that big gap between the, when the hearing is set until the hearing is held, held, that's when we propose that our customers put the ODR process in. We might as well let them start doing some negotiation. Go ahead and set your hearing and do everything like you had done before. So if they don't come to an agreement, you still have your hearing on the books, you're not going to make their case longer. You're just going to um, allow them to have negotiated a little bit. Okay, so, you know, how long before your hearing do you stop the process? So maybe um, 
on a typical, let's say we're doing a small claims case, maybe on a typical small claims case for you from the time that you set the hearing until the hearing's held, that's typically an 80-day window. Maybe you want to say, hey, I need about 10 days to make sure that I have everything ready to provide to the judges in court. So I want to give them 70 days to do that. Or maybe it takes you only one day to do that. So maybe you would allow them, you know, a 79-day window to negotiate. But whatever it is, you need to think about how long before your hearing happens do you want to stop because you can work back from that time. All right, so here's another one. How long does each party have to start the process? So, for example, once you send the invitation to the plaintiff, how long do you want to allow them to wait until they time out and we move on with just the regular court process instead of um, doing an online process? Maybe that is uh, three days, maybe it's five days, maybe it's 10 days. But again, as you're looking at the whole picture, That'll give you some options to think about how much time you have there. If you, from the time your hearing is set until your hearing is held, if you only have a 30-day window, you may not want to allow a party 10 days before they even do the first response because you're limiting so much time there. Maybe you only give them five days, for example. <clears throat> how long should the parties get to work in that party-to-party -party negotiation. So how long should they be able to talk back and forth with each other without any kind of third-party neutral involved before we say, okay, obviously you guys aren't going to be able to settle it. Let's bring in another party. Again, maybe that process, um, we want to, if we have an 80-day window, we want to allow them 40 days to be able to do that. And then it automatically goes to a, a neutral to jump in and help them after that on that 41st day. Maybe the new, you know, your mediators say, hey, typically this type of case takes us two hours to resolve. So maybe instead you want to give them 60 days to do it. And then that gives the mediators maybe a 20 day window. So just kind of think through that. <clears throat> and then how long should the mediators get to work online? And I kind of address that. Um, with the second one or that third option I was talking about that, you know, as you engage those mediators that deal with these types of cases all the time, they'll be able to tell you, you know, on average for uh, maybe a landlord tenant type case, we usually spend about an hour with the parties and we can get them to negotiate or maybe it's a, a parenting plan and they normally spend, you know, have two meetings that each last two hours and that's when they typically get agreements if they're going to get it. But they have an idea, even if it's just kind of a ballpark of how long it takes them. So getting them engaged and getting that feedback will help you understand where do you want to put this um, in the process. And, you know, this, these types of questions might sound a little overwhelming to you, especially if you're early in the ODR process. But, you know, your implementation team would help you with this and kind of give you some examples and really try to, you know, help guide you through it. This isn't something you would have to come up with completely on your own. And the other thing to think about is just because you start with a certain approach doesn't mean you have to stick to it. And I'll give you an example. We had a first that were doing a parenting plan, and the original approach that they had was to have their – um, each party get three days to engage in the process and complete their proposed parenting plan. Well, as they got started, they started getting feedback from the parties that, you know, if I had one more day, I could have come up, I think we could have come up with the option that would work for us. Or, you know, I, I got invited on a Friday and by Monday I was already out of time and I didn't even know I had been invited yet because I, I didn't pay attention to it over the weekend. And so we were able to take the feedback and make that longer so that more people would participate. So just because you start with a certain approach, don't think that you are stuck with that. You have options as you get more data. And especially, again, everything that I'm talking about really is something that can be different per type of case that you're working on. So as you think through it for small claims, that may not be the exact same approach that you would do for parenting and so forth. So really think through um, that on a case type by case type basis. OK, 
Okay, the next thing is our um, payment options. So, you know, you're going to have to determine how the, a project like this is going to be funded. Um, and for each option, I'm going to be transparent and really kind of explain some pros and cons specific to that type of approach. So we'll start with the court funded. You know, obviously this is going to have your highest participation because the parties don't have anything to lose, right, for trying an approach like this. They're not spending any money. But, you know, on the flip side, this is going to require some level of budgeting and maybe some additional work on the court. Maybe it's an RFP that has to happen. Maybe it's some legislative changes. Um, you know, no matter what it is, it may require more work and a little more time before you're able to get that started. Another approach is that you can have one party pay for it. So in this example, the plaintiff, you know, pays for the process. So Obviously, the cost to the court, which makes sense if they're not paying for it, the cost to the court goes down, but it will reduce participation a little bit because you're going to have um, some parties that are going to think, hey, I, I tried this approach already, and they didn't bite. They didn't participate with me. We tried over text before I ever got to, uh, in, you know, to make this a court case. And so maybe they just say, I don't, I don't have any interest in doing this again. I'm just going to wait for my day in court. Or maybe even you take an approach like splitting it between the parties. <clears throat> this um, approach we've really seen the lowest participation in um, because, you know, if you're, let's, again, we'll just talk a small claims case, but if you're the defendant on a small claims case, you don't have a whole lot of incentive to necessarily want to get this uh, completed quickly. You may want, you may not have the money that you need to, to pay for it, um, you know, the case. So if you resolve it quickly, you may not be able to satisfy that judgment or maybe you just, um, you know, the time that you're willing to take to go to court is minimal. So you're not worried about that stress of, of taking off work to get to court. Or maybe, you know, you think, hey, it'll just go away if I don't respond to it. So again, thinking about what payment option that you want to do and how that would work. And just like with everything else, you have the option to start with one approach on um, your cases. You could obviously switch that at a later time. And you even could do different options case type to case type. So maybe it's something that the court feels like they should fund for a certain type of case, but for other cases, they think that the party should fund it if they want to take an approach like that. So the next item here is your outcome document. So this is what do you want the output of this process to be? What type of documentation do you want to come from your ODR system? So we have a couple different options. The first one is a settlement agreement. And really, that term, you can use uh, whatever makes sense to, to your uh, jurisdiction, but the idea here is just that both parties have agreed to some um, conclusion on the case. Maybe they've agreed to reduce the cost and settle for a lesser amount. Maybe they've agreed to do, offer um, and accept payment plans instead of a one-time payment. Whatever it is, it's just that there was some agreement between those some are, which is when the mediators involved. So maybe um, on some cases, when the mediators engage, they're able to get a resolution. So again, on that one, maybe you want it to look a little bit different so that you know, oh, this one, the mediator was engaged, and that's how we came up with a the resolution. There's also an item that we call a partial agreement. And, you know, for cases like small claims and things like that, you may not even be negotiating more than one item. You may not, the dispute may be only one thing. But if you take a step back, and you look at something like parenting where maybe they're negotiating five or six topics, if they were able to come to an agreement on three of those, we certainly don't want to start over and have to renegotiate those that we already had the parties come up with an agreement on. So why not give us a little uh, leg up when we go to court that says, hey, we've already agreed to these, we only have one left to uh, negotiate. 
And then the last one is what we call a non-settlement agreement. So this is just saying, hey, we're not going to come to an agreement here. Um, we've tried. We've tried with the mediator. We've tried without him. We're just, uh, we need to go to court and see uh, where the law stands on for us. So again, those are the different types of documents. And you want to think about your legislative requirements, what type of information needs to be on those documents. Um, and, you know, maybe you don't want all of those different types. So think about what you want and what kind of information you want on those. Um, and then, you know, they can be filed back into your uh, e-filing system or your case management system. So you might want to also think about how you want those to go back into your system. Um, you know, for, for some of our customers, they would have to think about what docketing events they want to add and so forth. So just think through that approach. Okay, so the first um, step that we went through was the longest. So don't worry that there's not that many topics on all of these. Um, but now we are into our, our step two here, and this is our stakeholder support. <clears throat> so the first thing is your attorney preparation. So, you know, a, if you have a project like this, you can really have people that feel like uh, their outcome is at jeopardy here, and so they're going to have a lot of resistance for you. So that is why it is so important to make sure people understand what ODR is and get as many people that could be impacted by this engaged in the process to help support it, to help kind of have their buy-in to participate in it. You're always going to have attorneys that have a passion for um, pro providing access to justice, and they see that as you know part of their duties and responsibilities. Get them engaged to be activists for you. And then, you know, some people just think, hey, you're you're going to be taking food away from my family. So, um, you know, make sure that you understand their concerns and they also understand what types of parties we think are really going to be the ones that use this process. You know, maybe even have statistics that you can show them on saying, hey, 80% of our uh, cases don't even have, or at least one party isn't represented on. Well, maybe they had no idea it was that high, and they're thinking about just those cases they're representing. So give them some data so that they understand what the, the bigger picture is. Um, and also, make sure they understand that the attorneys are not being excluded from this process. They can join in and participate also. Um, but, you know, if they have concerns in there, Make sure that they feel like they're being heard. Um, many times as we've talked through this with uh, parties that are you know, concerned with it, the concerns that they have are very valid points. They, have, they bring up questions that we hadn't thought about. Um, there may be something that's some kind of legal uh, burbage that's due on a, on a document that for whatever reason we forgot or was excluded on there. Um, but you really don't want to have a, a solution that's provided, but then realize that you have some, some holes in that process. So get them engaged and let them um, feel like they're being heard and, and that you're taking them serious. Um, and then once they get engaged, a lot of times they like the process and kind of they'll, they'll drink the Kool-Aid with you, right? And they're excited about it. And then they can be an evangelist for you to, you know, go to these bar meetings and talk to the other idea and then them saying hey this is a great idea and here's why so it's a little different being pushed on someone versus a peer coming in and saying hey we really need to do this and here's why the other group is the mediator engagement and this group is equally as important as the attorneys um, you know, a lot of times your your whole mediation or ADR process is happening outside of the court process. I know some courts and some jurisdictions actually have the court-connected mediation that happens and, and it's court staff that do that, but many times it's not. So include them in part of the process so that you make sure that you are um, 
you know, providing a process that is as similar to what they have provided as possible and meets all the requirements, again, that you need. Um, and then, you know, understand, again, the same thing. What concerns do they, do they have? How can they help um, with this process? And, you know, also, in this day and age, well, you know, so many of us are, well, what is this going to do for me? Well, give them examples and reasons why this won't hurt them either. You know, maybe an example is, um, you know, I'm, again, I'm from Texas, and we have, we have far too many counties, so we have 254 counties. And I don't have these stats, but I would venture to say that we probably have about half the counties in the state that don't have mediators available at those counties. Most of our mediators and our firms that we have are in our largest, our larger jurisdictions. So maybe by explaining to an attorney that's in Austin that they can mediate a case that's in, um, you know, Panola County, a smaller county in East Texas, that that's a market that hasn't been served before. So maybe they would actually expand their business and their practice because they're able to um, they're able to work in places that previously they would have had to drive to. And if you drive from Austin to Panola, it's a four-hour drive. So it's not something you would be able to do on any kind of, um, you know, regular basis. So kind of put, put yourself in their shoes and think about, hey, what's in it for me? What's in it for them? And, and how can we get them to participate? Um, and then the other thing is we have noticed um, in our you know, in our pilots and some of the courts that we have, that there are certain types of mediators that are very resistant to this. And when they get in there and do this, maybe their negotiation rate or their closure rate isn't as high in an online process as what it is in person to, or in person mediation. But then on the flip side, we have some that the rates that they close cases online far exceed what they're able to do in person. So maybe this isn't a one for one. It's not every mediator in, that has worked with you should participate in this. Maybe there's certain mediators that want to and that are able to, you know, they are excited about the idea of um, working from home or being able to work at night instead of just during the business days. So really kind of Think about all the different ways that you can encourage them to participate. All right, so step three is our awareness. So the first thing you want to do is really get your uh, citizens or your um, the people that you serve, your constituents, get them uh, engaged in this to understand that there's a new process happening and how it works. So, you know, we've given some examples. Um, you know, maybe you want to do newspaper articles or maybe um, news segments or podcasts. Um, you also have legal aid offices, and most of the people that will participate in something like ODR are already uh, utilizing some kind of legal aid approach, whether it's an online approach or they're going into legal aid offices. So go to those legal aid offices and get them engaged and get them to help um, you know, put flyers out and encourage people and tell people as they talk to um, about, you know, what's going to happen and what to expect of this process so that you're, you have more people that are uh, getting people engaged. And even if maybe it's a, a family divorce type case, maybe you need to go to nonprofit, um, nonprofits like uh, churches or um, shelters or something to help them, you know, be aware of what's happening. So just kind of think through of all the places that you might be able to touch uh, the people going through these cases that are five cases or responding. So here's an example of uh, citizen awareness. This is what we um, provide to our customers. So we give them a couple different options here, and uh, they're one of them is a flyer that's kind of a larger flyer, flyer that they would hang in, um, you know, around the courthouse. Again, they would pass it to the legal aid office to put it up on doors and windows. Um, maybe it's in the elevator at the courthouse. Maybe it's in those uh, churches or nonprofits that I talked about. They, they have them there. And also a smaller version of it that is a um, 
we call it a little rack card, but maybe it's something that would be handed out um, as they come in to file these cases, or maybe it's something that you put in uh, any kind of subpoena that goes out or citation or notice of filing. Um, you just put it in the envelope that's sent out so that they get it and they understand what process it is. So again, any kind of things like that that you can just have sitting out on the counters in the clerk's offices or hanging um, up on the walls in the um, courthouse will get people aware and they'll start hearing um, about it. So once they're engaged in the process or being invited into the process, they'll have a little bit of, oh, I remember that. That's what I saw at the court. And so the last step here is um, our measuring success. All right, so you really want to determine um, what is your desire for ODR? Why are you doing it? Are you doing it just because it's the next big cool thing? Maybe that's the case, but probably you have some other reason why you're participating in that. So take a step, step back, determine what your goals are and what types of changes that you want to see in your court, um, and then consider how you can measure those. So you may want to say, hey, for us, we're, we want our cases to be closed more quickly. So maybe you want to, before you start ODR, you want to say, hey, for the six months prior to ODR starting, we, it, you know, on our small claims cases, they averaged being closed within 65 days. And so maybe you want to set a benchmark or a goal for what you want. Hey, maybe ultimately we would be happy if we could get those closed in 50 days. So you have something that you're shooting for and you're, as you're going through this, you're really starting to say, okay, now we're at, you know, we started out at 60 days. Now we've cut off one day and we're at 59 on average. But thinking about why you're doing this and understanding how you're going to call this a success and you want to do that before you implement because a lot of times, if you wait until the implementation, you may not be able to get the data that you wanted. Um, you know, maybe it's just that you want your uh, litigants to be able to have a process that's less confusing than the current process. I think um, when the state of Utah implemented their ODR system for small claims, one of the things that they um, thought about was how many steps it took a litigant to, to do what they needed to do in a small claims process. And so their goal was, hey, we want to cut back the number of steps that they have to take. Maybe that's your goal. Maybe, like the example I said earlier with the mediators, maybe you live in one of those communities that don't have access to mediation. So maybe you just want your uh, smaller court or, or jurisdiction to be able to have the same access that the larger urban um, communities do. Maybe, the court isn't able to process all the cases because you know, staffing um, levels have been cut short or the judges have, you, know, you haven't gotten the number of judges that you need for the number of cases that are coming in. Maybe your, um, you know, your backlog is really high in certain case types and you need to, to try to get that down. So figure out what your goal or goals are and then start thinking about how can you measure those and how much time do I want to spend measuring them. So if you say, hey, I'm going to go look at what my six month um, case closure time was, well then once you start ODR, don't say, okay, well for the first month we were at 65, so this process isn't working. Well, you gave yourself six months of data before, so make sure you give yourself six months of data after because maybe it was just some, you know, getting the process going and learning a little bit. <clears throat> so again, here's kind of some of the examples to measure um, what your outcome is um, and your baselines. Really try to kind of understand how you can get all of this data. So all of our um, implementations after the parties either come to an agreement or maybe they don't come to an agreement, but once the ODR process is finalized, we send out a survey to them and, you know, we try to make it as small as possible, but we want to know, you know, 
why did you participate in this? You know, did you find it helpful? Did you find it was more confusing? And, you know, we take that same survey across different jurisdictions so that we can really look at the whole picture and understand what's happening for all of the parties involved, no matter if they're in Las Vegas or they're in Austin, Texas. What is what things are the same and what's different? And I had told you earlier that, you know, we had uh, we had some feedback on our survey that said, hey, this process was too short and we could have resolved it had we had a little more time. So you take the feedback that comes in from those surveys serious and you try to see what can I do, you know, what's kind of a systemic problem that I'm getting in all of my surveys and how can I fix that? You may have um, agencies that want to interview the parties that participate. So maybe they're sitting down and asking a set of questions to uh, the litigants that come in to understand how they interpreted the process, where they felt like it went wrong, where it went right, all of those kind of things. Um, and then obviously you can, most of your case management systems are able to pull out any data uh, that you can that will be able to sh show that and, and help you. But just remember that as you get this information, the most important part is that you use the information to make the process better, right? If you're collecting surveys and you're never looking at them, you might as well stop wasting people's time of giving the survey. But if you take that and you actually do something with that, then you're helping the next person that participates in it. And you're helping all those that come after them. So if you're going to, to go through the effort of collecting it, make sure that you're looking at it and that you're using it and understanding it um, and, you know, making changes and recommendations based on what you're getting from uh, the litigants. All right, so I am through uh, the content here. I do want to tell you that if you go to uh, tylertech.com slash mobile with Modria, you will be able to um, register to win an iPad, and you can also register to win or register to see a live demo of our product in action. So here are some of the viewings that are coming up that you'll actually be able to see an example of a small claims uh, process that I kind of talked about here and how you, you'll be able to better understand the implementation of those processes. So don't forget to go out there and uh, register for a webinar if you'd like to see another one or at least uh, register to your chance to get an iPad. And then here is my contact information. So we do have time for Q&A that will happen in just a second. But in the event that you have something more specific that you would like to talk to me about or some clarification maybe on something, uh, feel free to shoot me an email and I will uh, get back with you as soon as I can. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Uh, as Jamie said, she's now going to begin the ans begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. And I want to remind uh, attendees that you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Our first question is from Melanie Zaber. And Melanie asks, what additional online court services do you have in mind? Um, I'm trying to remember when I referenced online court services. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of what we see our customers using are um, looking up their case information online, such as when their hearings are, what uh, types of filings have been happening on their cases. So, you know, how to pay maybe for their case online. Those are the things that we see a lot of customers um, using just different online court services for. So I'm not sure if I answered the question because I can't remember exactly where that was in my presentation. Okay. okay, thank you, Jamie and Melanie. Just as a reminder, you can always email Jamie with uh, follow-up questions. Melanie also has a couple more questions. She um, wants to know, how do you verify participant identity? <clears throat> this is a great question, and this is a question we get all the time. And I'll tell you, 
Um, so the way that we do this is we get the information uh, from what has been submitted to the court, so that contact information, and then we um, do an outreach to them. So we would invite them to participate in the process from the information that they gave to the court. So like, for example, through their email that was provided. Now, what I always say to people, and, and I have had this backfire on me one time, but in all honesty, you probably don't check people's uh, IDs when they come to court. So you don't know 100% that the person that's even representing uh, the party in court is the person they say they are. But most jurisdictions have some kind of process that would happen if you found out that the person participating wasn't actually the person there. So for Modria, for our system at Tyler, we collect their IP address, when they were connected, that kind of information so that we have a little bit of a digital footprint. If we have to go back, if you know maybe someone, um, there's a situation where someone says, hey, I was sued for this, but I never was contacted, and it said I agreed to this and I didn't, we would be able to go back and see, well, who participated as that party? Um, you know, again, what was their IP address? When did they do it? As much information as we could get. So that is, that's the answer that we have uh, to that. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Melanie also is asking for your thoughts on on-site ODR versus from home ODR to ensure equal access to justice. Sure. So, you know, really, you d there's no reason to um, limit that it has to be on site. We, most of our jurisdictions do have some level of public terminals in which they would allow people to participate in this. But because they can do it from their phone and, you know, they could do it outside of court hours, that's really why we wouldn't want to limit it only to on site. Um, participation because you know maybe someone works eight to five and if they take off then they don't get paid for that day well if they have a phone a smartphone there's really we don't want to limit them from being able to participate in you know in their case just because they couldn't take off and go to the court so I think it's a great idea to have both um, an in you know a, a approach that's at your jurisdiction that's, you know, maybe a public access computer that can get to the internet that can uh, be able to help people if they don't have a phone or a computer, or uh, they could do that at home if they, if they do have the equipment that they need in order to be able to do it. Okay, and Sharon Sturgis would like to know if you'd be willing to share some of the surveys that you mentioned. Sure. Hi, Sharon. Um, I know you. <laughs> yes, um, sure. I'll, I can provide. Um, we will, we're sending out this, um, all the slides here. So I can also, um, when I'm getting that together, I can also show some of the questions that we provide in the surveys for people. Absolutely. Okay, great. And I think that you answered her next question, which was about interview questions. So, um, okay. but if not. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Julie, Julia Spear wants to know, do you run into problems with case types where an appearance is required? You know, <clears throat> I, I, we do definitely. And we also run into situations where you have to have like documents notarized. So what we see is the, the, the judicial process um, and the rules that were made have not caught up with current technology. So most of the time in the customers that we're working with on this, they will help us work with whoever needs to, whether it's a local rule that needs to be put in place that uh, changes that requirement or if they even have to do legislation that changes it. Because the reality is we, so many things were set up and processes were put in place long before the internet was available, everyone had access to that plus videos on the phone at any moment. That's something that you're going to end the contact with. You just need to figure out who can help you fix that. And most of the time you're going to have some party within your uh, jurisdiction that is more than willing to help with whatever it is because it's just kind of a silly rule that's 
it's always been that way and that's why we have to do it. So once you can kind of give them enough information that they feel good about it, then they'll be willing to help run with that and, and get that change. Okay, thank you. Simone Seiler would like to know, can the judges or their staff review cases before sending them to ODR? Sure, so the way that it works for our um, product specifically is we have in our case management system, we have um, that they docket an event or they add an event on the case and that's what sends it to ODR. But you don't have to use our case management system to use our, our ODR system. So it's basically, you, you decide at what point are you gonna send it over. Um, the example that I had, I said, hey, after an answer is filed, that's when you would do it. But it may be a perfectly normal process that a judge or a clerk says, hey, if we have this, you know, if it meets this criteria, then we want it to start an ODR. So there's nothing that's stopping you from determining what that criteria is. Okay, great. And Charles Heidovitz wants to know how much, if any, extra work is there for the clerk staff? So <clears throat> again, there's so many ODR vendors, so I want to make sure that on questions like this, I'm speaking specifically for our um, products because I don't have that information on others. But the upfront time on making sure that the, the questions that are being asked, the timeline that's being uh, provided, the outcome documents that are being done, that is the only time that there is additional work for the court staff. Um, and it is still pretty minimal at that side. Other than that, once it once it's going, the the clerks and the court staff should really have they shouldn't even know that it's happening. Other than a case might uh, they may get a filing where there's been an agreement and they have to go close that case down um, and you know cancel the hearings. But and even that can be automated in you know most case management systems. So really. The beginning part is all that you should have impact for, and really you should actually start seeing a reduction in some of the time that uh, the staff has to work with the self-represented litigants or working on those cases that are happening. Okay, thank you. And Jacqueline Waters says, upfront work regarding integrations was mentioned. Please briefly describe the nature of this upfront work. What are the common challenges associated with ODR, CMS, e-filing integration? Well, hello, Ms. Jackie. Um, so you are a Tyler customer in, in all those areas, so the integration is already there and available. But um, there is a, the National Center for State Courts is in the process of coming up with standards for what ODR solutions, how they integrate with those different components of the court system. So as those standards become more defined and more accepted through the ODR community, then the upfront approach is gonna be, it's gonna slowly reduce because there's a standard integration approach. Uh, for right now, at least on Tyler's side, we are using um, the standard ECF component, um, e-filing component, standards, I don't know, I think I just said standards too many times, but we're using the, those standards uh, for our APIs to make sure that we are um, at least trying to mimic a process that's already in place so that we can help expedite that. Um, so I don't know if I answered that question well enough, but I can definitely talk more about that if, if you have questions. Thank you, Jamie. And um, Tina, Jay, with, uh, she's trying to access your website, so she asks if you could please repeat the web address. Yes, I will go back. Um, there it is right there. So it's tylertech.com slash mobile with Modria. Okay, I see the mistake, Tina. Um, you have mo mobile with media. All right, thank you, Jamie. Michael Upton wants to know, how do parties sign agreements and documents as part of this process? So the way that it's done is that those are electronic signatures. So um, once agreement is made, so both parties have put in what they want out of this process and there is an agreement that's reached, then uh, the parties would go in and 
say, yes, I agree to this, and then type their name in, and then that would be on the document as the slash S slash, and then the name. Uh, so again, that might be something, depending on the jurisdiction, that you need to make sure um, meets the rules. As e-filing has become so prevalent, uh, we really have seen most jurisdictions have allowed that electronic signature just based on uh, e-filing rules. But that's something, obviously, you would want to check with your particular jurisdiction. Okay, and Walla el Sheikh, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, um, asks, how does ODR or a court using ODR offer transparency to the court user in this process? Transparency to the court user. Um, so I will say that just like your typical ADR processes, we really try to keep this confidential in the negotiation aspect. We don't want... Um, we don't want the, the court users or the judges to be able to see what the parties are negotiating on, just like if mediation was happening. They most likely are not going to be sitting in the room and understand that, nor are they going to be getting documents from the mediators. So what we do is, as part of that integration, we are passing back statuses to the court users so that they, at a very high level, understand where you are in the process. So maybe we say, hey, you know, the plaintiff has engaged, we're waiting on the defendant, or maybe, the, you know, they're in the process of party-to-party -party negotiation. Maybe we say an, a mediator has been invited to participate, um, and so forth. So we keep it very high level. We don't talk about any of the specifics. And then we also make sure that the court users are aware of the deadline. So, hey, this, um, you know, will end up, this case will end up being automatically closed out in, you know, four days if a resolution doesn't happen. So that at any time they know what's happening on the case, which in, in most jurisdictions is far different than what they can ever have on an in-person mediation, because they don't know if they've met with the mediator, they don't know if they've come to an agreement unless they've gotten the filing. So typically the transparency of a system like this is much higher than what you would have in an in-person setting. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Diana Ronk also asked, let's see, what are the most common case types? Oh, your most common case types are definitely your small claims, debt collection type cases, uh, where you have a high volume and, you know, a lower sophistication of cases. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, traffic and and then the parenting one, which I always think is interesting because uh, that's definitely one of your more complex cases. And so it's, it interest, it's interesting to me that people are able to do that online. Um, but those, I would say, are probably your highest um, level. I think a lot of people are looking for the landlord-tenant type cases. But most of the time, the timelines on those are so short that it scares them a little bit that this process won't work. Um, but I think in reality, it, it will probably work better than what um, we have in the, the in-person process. Okay, and Deborah Ingledew asks, can defendants upload documents through ODR if the court has a rule that allows it? Absolutely. So our ODR system allows... Um, stuff to be uploaded so that the other party can see that. Now, what we do not do is we do not pass that, uh, that information back into the court's case management system as evidence because, um, you know, if they are going to present it as evidence, there are certain rules that they have to do in court uh, for that process. So we just allow it to help engage the process of the, the negotiations between the party and even with the mediator. And we allow um, pretty much any type of document that you can think of. So from Excel spreadsheets to, you know, PDFs to videos to images and Word documents and so forth. Okay, thank you. And Tina wants to point out that she's still struggling to um, access the website. So, Jamie, could you pull up that, that website slide again and, and let's check the site one more time. Okay, she's got www.tylertech.com slash mobile with Modria. Modria. Um, I'm not sure what the issue is there, but uh, we might want to look into that, Jamie. And then we have one okay. last question from Michael Upton. 
uh, it's a follow-up on the signing question. Where does the signing med metadata reside? Does it stay in Mod Modria or is it pushed with the document into the CMS? It is pushed with the document in the CMS. Okay. Um, we really try to separate the two and make the CMS the official record um, and, and just make the ODR system, you know, that point of time. So once we get stuff finalized, everything should go over to uh, the CMS for being the, the official uh, record of the case. Okay, great. And I want to point out that one of our other uh, attendees has indicated that they are not having a problem with the URL. So. Um, just to just to let Tina know and others know. And with that, okay, I think thank we've you. I, I thought I had checked it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think we've addressed our last question. Um, I I want to just take a few moments to uh, share a few announcements. Macomb's annual conference will be held at the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, from July 21st through the 25th. You can register today at nakemnet.org. The latest edition of the Court Leaders Advantage podcast series entitled Blockchain Is It Your Court's Future airs tomorrow. You can subscribe to this podcast series using your favorite podcast app. CLA podcasts cover a broad range of topics, including emergency planning, disaster recovery, and artificial intelligence. For non NACM members who are participating in today's webinar, I encourage you to consider membership. NACM is the largest organization of court management professionals in the world. In addition to providing quality education at its conferences, with membership, you also have access to webinars, publications, guides, and other materials that inform members about best practices, innovations, and issues affecting courts today. NACOM also provides a forum for working with other colleagues in the profession to improve the administration of justice. Join today at nakemnet.org. And as I mentioned earlier, the recording of today's webinar, along with the presenter slides, will be available on NACOM's website via the member portal. Uh, once again, I thank Tyler Technologies for sponsoring today's webinar and our presenter, Jamie Gillespie, for her time and expertise. On behalf of the National Association for Court Management, Tyler Technologies, and Jamie, thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>